Welcome to Copy Traders Club, where you can learn how to make more money copy trading. I'm Gavin McCauley, my name and username on eToro. You can continue the conversation on Discord and Facebook. If you like this podcast and want to see it continue, you can do your part by recommending it to one person or a group of people this week. Today we chat with a recently crowned Black Star PI. Although he has not been on eToro long, his rise is nothing short of meteoric. Shall we step into the clubhouse? You go first. Here we go. Episode 33 of Copy Traders Club, and today we welcome Hugo Manonti to the Copy Traders Clubhouse. I think he's accustomed to the finer things in life. Indeed, I can see him sipping champagne, appellation contrôlée, in the back of the limousine as it pulls up the driveway. Here he comes. Hugo, bonjour, bienvenue au Copy Traders Club. <laughs> bonjour, Gavin. Thanks very much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here with the, the cool boys and girls. Well, the cool boys and girls are excited to have you. I know you've listened to a couple of episodes, so you know that in order to get into the Copy Traders Lounge, you need to clear reception first via a series of quickfire questions. Ready for those? Ready. Username on eToro. Hugo Manenti 95. Date you joined eToro. March 2020. Year of birth? 1989. Place of residence? Barcelona. Profession? Corporate Development Director um, until next Wednesday and soon to be eToro Popular Investor. Briefly state what you aim to achieve on eToro. One, generate market beating returns for as many people as possible. And two, empower those people to make the best decisions for themselves by sharing my experience and knowledge with them. Name one of your investing heroes. Bill Miller. Name one of your favorite investing books. That would be not exactly a book, but the letters from Howard Marks. That completes the formalities. Let's proceed into the VIP section here at the Copy Traders Clubhouse. The magnificent Copy Traders Lounge awaits. Hugo Manonti, aka Hugo Manonti95. Are you ready for this magical transition? As ready as one can be. Okay, so here we are now in the Copy Traders Lounge. Hugo Angelo Lucien Manenti, or Hugo Manenti, to those who can't be bothered pronouncing your name correctly. Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, I've been looking forward many, many, many months and uh, enjoying all of, your, all of your podcasts. So looking forward to a great conversation with you. But tell me, do you call yourself Hugo Manenti or Hugo Manenti? Well, I don't really call myself, so that makes it easier for me. <laughs> um, it, it kind of, no, it, the serious answer is um, it, it's location dependent. So if I'm, if I'm in the UK, people call me Hugo Manenti and it's fine. Here in Barcelona, I'm Hugo Manenti, which is fine as well. And back in France, I'm Hugo Manenti. I'm not, I'm not too precious about it, to be honest. Okay, so back in France, where in France are you from? I'm from the, the suburbs of Paris, um, about 15 kilometers northwest of, of the city. And currently you live in Barcelona? Yes, I do. After graduating from, from university, I moved to London, where I lived for five years, and then moved to Barcelona, where I've been for a little over two years. It's a beautiful city. I, I'd heard there were complaints from residents in Barcelona a while back about how tourism had gone too far and was ruining life there. I wonder, have attitudes softened a little now that they've had a taste of life without tourism, thanks to La Corona? Well, 
I think it's fair to say that people have enjoyed Barcelona without the tourists for the last year and a half. It's been really a bit eerie at, at times, you know, walking the streets, pretty empty, silence. It's been, it's been beautiful, to be honest. Um, but then since, I would say since June, tourists have come back and it feels almost like worse than, than before. Um, the ones that have come back have come back to, to party and to drink. It's a bit, it's a bit complicated, to be honest. So you're about to change rules. You had been working for a company called Fluidra, a global leader in the swimming pool industry and wellness industry. Your corporate development and investor relations there. Indeed, I've been doing mostly corporate development, which means essentially acquiring companies in specific um, geographies or specific segments of the market in order to generate synergies and growth and, and, and growth in those markets, segments, countries. So you kind of like look at the, the whole strategy of the company, you know, where the company wants to be in five years, and you try to execute that by, by external mergers and acquisitions. So I've been sort of leading that, that effort over the last two years. So I've enjoyed doing that work for, for the last two years. Um, but I think my, my passion, my real passion is, is investing. And, um, I've been very lucky that it all worked very well for me and, you know, got a, around 10,000 copiers and, and a lot of AUM. And that allows me to essentially live off it. And so I've, I've decided recently to, to take that step and, and make it all my, my full time job. Uh, so obviously I'm, I'm super excited about it. And the, I think the aim will be to keep doing what I've been doing in terms of investing, but really, um, ramp up the communication a lot. Um, you know, videos, a lot more posts, a lot more company analysis. And there's a sort of like second part now of, of what I see as my mission that I mentioned just before, trying to share my knowledge and experience that I haven't really been able to do the last, the last year and that I'm really looking forward to, to doing in the, in the near future. Okay, fantastic. Well, we'll come on to all of that later. Uh, let's just keep filling in the background sure. of Ugo. You attended the HEC Paris Business School, a very prestigious establishment. Let me read a quote I found about HEC Paris, or HEC, as I imagine it's called. Founded in 1881 by the Paris Chamber of Commerce and Industry, is one of France's oldest elite higher education grande école. Through its 130-year history, HEC Paris has attracted talented, innovative, entrepreneurial, ambitious, and open-minded individuals. Would you use those adjectives to describe yourself, Hugo? Talented, innovative, entrepreneurial, ambitious, and open-minded? I'm a little too modest to use those adjectives for myself. <laughs> I would love to use them and I, and I hope that people use them about myself, but I certainly wouldn't talk about myself in those words. <laughs> a little bit more here from my research. Here's a question. Did you back a project for the youth orchestra of Ile de France? I did help them a tiny little bit at, at the start. I mean, it was a, a project from a few of my, of my close friends. So a tiny help to help them get started. I wasn't a major contributor, but um, I think it's important to have your friends when you can. Are you a lover of classical music? Do you play any instruments? I don't, unfortunately. I, I sort of haven't had that, that education. I love music in general. I would say classical is is one of the bits that I do appreciate, but I'm much more, I think over time I've grown a lot more uh, fond of more modern music. Well, you know what they say, art du classique, la musique, adouci les mœurs. <laughs> Indeed. Do you know who I'm quoting there? That would be someone from the 17th century. No, I, I, I don't remember, but I've heard that quote Well, before. I don't know where it originated from, but I heard it from MC Solar, the king of 90s French rap, oh. from his seminal album, Qui s'aime le vent, récolte le tempo. Link in the show notes. Indeed, great artist. Speaking of great artists, do you have a photo credit online 
of Interpol playing at the Royal Albert Hall? I do. Good research. They're actually my favorite band. And they're also, um, I, I met my, my girlfriend and fiance at an Interpol gig. So it's a band that means a lot to me. Your girlfriend and fiance, both of them? Well, girlfriend became fiance. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I like them myself, uh, Interpol. First time I heard them. Well, let's see if you can finish my sentence. First time I heard them, given that I'm a bit older than you, I thought, here's a band very much influenced by a band that was very important in my musical education from Britain called... I would assume Joy Division. Yes, Joy Division. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I hear it so clearly in their music. Yes. The I mean, they're both probably my two favorite bands ever, so. I, it's especially true in the track Evil. You can really hear Ian Curtis coming through. Yes. In that song. Yes. Immortality yes. through influence. Slow Hands is also a great tune. Yes. And they also sang There's No I in Threesome. <laughs> is that a sentiment you agree with, Ugo? I guess. I guess so. I mean, you can think about that one on many levels. <laughs> I don't know if we want to get into that. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, but thank you for uh, mentioning in your pinned post that you were into Interpol, because I do like them. I've had them on my computer, like a few albums for ages, but I haven't listened to them for a long time. Hmm. So they've been kind of on a loop over the past few days. Oh. So thank you for that. You're welcome. They're wonderful. Some investors like to meditate to unwind or they play golf or something similar of a relaxing nature. Your alter ego likes to rip off his suit and tie and go to live indie gigs, sweatily throwing yourself around in the mosh pit, taking a few punches to the face to make you feel alive. Yes, that's exactly what I do on, on my weekends and, and Friday nights. Um, no, seriously, actually. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a good way to unwind and, uh, you know, you need to enjoy yourself. Yeah, that's very different from the image that people probably have of you, especially like your eToro photo. Hmm. Suited, well-dressed young man, hair nice and neat, serious businessman. Hmm. But black t-shirt goes on and off you go to the gig. Yes, there's two Hugos in that way. But it's a, it's a good point about the Toro photo. I think uh, I'll be I'll be looking to to do a set because um, I'm not sure my my Toro photo really reflects who I am. It's difficult with one photo. It is. I, I'm sure it's not going to be long until Etoro give you the opportunity to have various photos, video links, and things like that mm. to build up the profile. Yeah. So how did I come across you? I had seen your name around a little bit, but I hadn't really zeroed in on you until I was talking to Marcin Jasinski, MJ Lux, who mentioned you as one of the more professional PIs, a group in which he includes himself. You guys come from a background of finance, really, and you know how to structure a portfolio. You met up in Barcelona, didn't you? Yes, it was, it was visiting the city, and so we... We had the opportunity to meet. It was it was great. Um, we had a great conversation, um, a really nice time together. And I think, um, you know, due to the pandemic, we haven't had a, a lot of opportunities to to meet other other PIs. So that was really great. So did you meet up in a little authentic tapas place near Casa Mila? So I I live in in El Born, uh, in the city center. We met in a tapas place near my house. And then had a, a little drink on my on my terrace. It was lovely. Well, when I picture that scene, I picture you both elegantly dressed, like a pair of gentlemen from the early 1900s, cravats and walking canes, twirling your moustaches and laughing at the terrible portfolio management you see by some of these amateurs <laughs> on eToro. I think I think you got it quite right. <laughs> 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 and drinking cognac. <laughs> Very good. All right, let's have a question from the art of people. Can you give me a number between one and ten? 
a big two. Number two, if you had enough money to retire and then some, what would you be doing? Exactly what I'm doing today. Um, invest that money in the stock market for myself and for other people and, you know, enjoy doing it. Okay, shortly we're going to have a little look at your bio, Hugo, but uh, perhaps you can tell us, first of all, what's going on with the color of your star? So I think what happened is... um, Essentially, in order to get the black star, you need to comply with the minimum equity and the minimum AUM requirements, which I had. And then you need to have either a certain number of years on the platform or be a professional finance person. Uh, so I don't have the platform experience, but I, I sort of comply with the second, the second option, which is to be a financial professional. But I think in order to put me to the black star, they probably had to do a sort of like manual adjustment into the system. And it's sort of like reverted back um, at the end of last month. And so, you know, I I send an email to my account manager and that switches back to to black as it should be. It's black today? Yes. Back to black? Back to black. Do you get that musical reference? Absolutely. (laughs) Another good one. (laughs) Hugo, would you like to now read your bio down to and including investment themes? So, about 10 years of experience in investment banking and private equity, Master of Science in Management from HSC Paris, number one European business school, French national living in Barcelona. Investment objective, bid the S&P 500 on a risk-adjusted basis. Investment parameters, 90% plus stocks, long-term horizon, mix of growth and value, medium risk, diversification, no leverage. Investment themes, accelerating transition towards a more digital economy, small cap cyclical stocks are cheap and will rebound strongly, public and private investment in infrastructure, networks, and green energy. If you are considering copying me, minimum $500, do copy open trades. The longer you stay, the better the returns. Volatility is part of the game, patience is key. At your disposal for any questions or feedback. Very good. It's very nicely laid out, your bio and your pinned post. Uh, Investment objective, beat the S&P 500 on a risk-adjusted basis. It's a very sensible objective. Can you explain to the listener why you put it like that? Yes. I think the risk part is very important. What I mean by that is essentially... If you beat the S&P 500 by 5 or 10% in a given year by taking a ridiculous amount of risk, then you're not really beating the S&P 500. I think the return needs to be compared with the risk that you're taking in order to achieve that return. Otherwise, it's kind of meaningless. So I think return and risk are both as important. On that subject, how about the eToro risk score? Do you consider your risk score fair? At the moment, uh, the, the risk score that I have is four. I think that's fair. I think I'm between four and five, um, which corresponds to, to medium risk equity portfolio with a good diversification. I would say it's pretty fair. Let's talk about copier numbers and assets under management. Copiers, 10,066. Assets under management, According to your fact sheet, your assets under management is about 25 million. Indeed. Good going. Not too bad. Your copier graph is a story of a rapid ascent, then a period of gradual decline, then a second rapid ascent and a period of gradual decline. Can you describe the story behind that picture? Sure. It's, it's pretty easy to understand, I believe. Um, I started organically, of course, um, you know, not really looking to be a, a PI or um, a very well-known PI, but by just posting and commenting and interacting with people, I started getting more and more copiers. So I thought, you know, why not apply to join the PI scheme? 
uh, which I did. And I had, I believe, around 50 to 100 copiers when it all reached out to me, telling me that, you know, my, my profile seemed really interesting and they had a lack of financial professionals as PIs. So they were looking to um, potentially promote me a little bit. So we had a few conversations. They, they liked me and my profile and decided to put me on, on editor's choice. So, so that would be the first ascent that you can see on, on the chart. And then a few months passed where I think the, the copier count was pretty, pretty stable, slightly declining. And, um, early this year, they, they promoted me again. Um, I don't remember if it was a notification that was sent to everyone or an, an editor's choice, um, again. And so that's the second spike that you can see on, on the chart. So obviously what it tells you about Itoro is that organic is difficult and it's much easier to be on the, on the editor's page. Nevertheless, I think the, the conversion that I had from um, viewers to copiers was, was pretty great actually compared with other PIs. Um, at least that's the feedback that I got from Itoro. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Yes. And they're not uh, leaving you in droves shortly afterwards. You're maintaining their loyalty quite well. Exactly. So you only joined eToro in March 2020. And you've risen incredibly fast. I thought Robert Merck's rise was meteoric. But uh, you're way ahead of him at the moment, which I'm sure is driving the very competitive Robert mad right now. You had 2020 in 10 months, a return of 87%, which was extraordinary. And a Good 2021 so far, with a return to date of 20.7% currently. I also saw you on a video with Robert. Do you know him well? We've been exchanging quite a lot recently, and I think we're looking to do a little more together. I think we have pretty similar outlooks, ways of constructing the, the portfolios and sort of sweet, sweet spot for, I think, reasonably priced cross companies. Um, he he produces amazing content, I I believe. So I think we're quite keen to do a little more together because it seems that it generated quite a bit of interest. Yeah, his uh, individual stock videos are the most detailed things you're ever going to see. I can't. Are you going to be producing videos of a similar type? Will there be a different Ugu style? Yeah, they, they, they'll have my own style. And I think I'd probably drill a, a little more into the financials, the margins, the markets, possibly, and maybe a bit less on the technical side of things. But I think our way of thinking is, is very similar. So you'll find that the, the stock videos that I, that I would produce would be fairly similar to his. Another similarity I see in the two of you is he likes to say volatility is the price you pay for long-term gains. In your bio, you say volatility is part of the game. Mm. Patience is key. Yeah. Yet I see, even after just a couple of red months, both under 1%, copiers tend to run for the hills. How difficult is it to get the point across that patience is key? Extremely difficult on eToro. Uh, I'm not sure people really control their emotions or think strategically or, or rationally in terms of their copies. I mean, most do, but some don't. And, and it's, it's a fair point. I've lost, I think, two, two and a half percent in the space of two months. And I've lost 10% of my copiers. 10%? Yes. Wow. I don't even want to think about what would happen if I lost, say, 8%. <laughs> um, yeah. Don't go quitting that job. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that comes after, I think, 10 straight months of, of gains. I mean, my only red month so far had been minus 0. I think 0.04%. I mean, yeah, I think it's difficult. I think a lot of people jump uh, between PIs or from PIs to crypto, whatever seems hot at the moment, and it's, uh, they sort of chase whatever's hot. But obviously doing so, you this is how you lose money. Um, because once you jump on something that's hot, then it gets cold, and you end up jumping from money losers to money losers it's um it's a terrible strategy but i think 
some people unfortunately are are driven by emotions. Do you think that's just a feature of uh, eToro being quite new and copy trading being such a young practice? It needs to mature as a an undertaking. Possibly, yes. I think it's also a feature of human nature, impatience, and um, you know, being driven by emotions. Uh, and you see that in real life, in all aspects of your life, and you also see that in investing. And, and I think the natural impulse when something goes down and red is, is to sell. And when things go up and green is, is to buy. And obviously, you need to sort of fight that natural impulse if you want to be a good investor. Uh, but people either don't really know it or can't behave themselves, essentially. <laughs> um, and it's difficult. It takes, it takes practice. It takes you know, knowing yourself knowing how to manage your emotions, knowing how to take a, a step back and look at your actions and, and try to improve the things that you can improve about yourself. It, it's not easy. Is that going to be one of the points that you repeat on videos when you start making them for your copiers? I think so. I think, you know, you need to learn about the markets, you need to learn about the companies, but you also need to learn about yourself. Um, you know, think about a football player, you know, they, they know the tactics. But they also pra- practice a lot, you know. Um, you need to train your skills every every single day. And I think as an investor, it's no different. You need to train your skills. You need to look at how you... You always need to take a step back and look at how you've traded for the past month, for instance, the mistakes you've made. Why did you make those mistakes? Bad control of your emotions or a flow in your thinking process. It's very important to be self-reflective, I think, and, and look at how how you act in order to be able to then correct it and, and improve yourself. So it's as much about the thinking process as it is about improving yourself as a human being and how you, you sort of control your emotions. Yes, you mentioned just there keeping an eye on the market and knowing how things are changing over time. Looking back at the last month of activity, both you and Robert seem to be very sort of nimble, responsive investors. You don't just buy and and leave it for a year. You're very much monitoring how things are going and the cycles within the cycle of the market. Was that fair to say? It's it's very fair to say. I think I'm a long-term investor, but I don't simply buy and hold. I think I try to have an extra edge, an extra kick to the performance by looking at the macro environment and adapting the portfolio to to what I'm seeing on, on the macro. And obviously, being able to control my own emotions and, you know, do some nice swing trades when I see a, a drop that doesn't seem justified by any, any fundamental factors. So I think those two things, you know, adapting the portfolio to the macro environment and then knowing how and when to do a bit of swing trade, um, help both control volatility, risk, and generate an extra, an extra return above the pure buy and hold. Connected to that, then let's have a look at your trades per week and the average holding time. Okay, so trades per week, 22. Average holding time, 1.5 months. What does that reveal? I think that reveals um, two things. One, that I'm an active investor, I'm always ready to take advantage of opportunities as they arise. And two, that I take great care in synchronizing the portfolio for my copiers. I never let profit or, lo- or losses run too deep because that creates de- desynchronization for new copiers. And the two or three times that I've had to add significant funds, I've reset the whole portfolio. So that obviously work to synchronize copiers at all times means a lot of trades. So let's discuss communication a little bit. You're quite busy in terms of posting on your feed, a lot of high quality posts, in-depth posts. But you used to be quite low profile other than that. However, suddenly you seem to be popping up all over the place in various YouTube chats. There was one you did with Marcin Jasinski, MJ Lux, and as we mentioned, Robert Merck just recently. So suddenly you're something of a media darling. (laughs) Yes, um, I think video is a very... A potent form of communication and I think it allows people to know you on a slightly different level so I've essentially tr- been trying to to grow that a, a little bit and it's uh, an objective 
for the near and medium term to sort of start a YouTube channel and put my face out there a little more. Even just from what I've seen of you recently on those YouTube videos, it, I suddenly know you so much better just from those. And obviously, they're very helpful for my research. So in your chat with MJ Lux, which was very enjoyable, uh, you went through various matters of the market and individual stocks and plans for the next six months. You have a very different approach in terms of the size of upside you're looking for. Can you explain that? Yes, I think when I think about it, um, Martin, in some in some aspects of his investing, looks a bit like a VC venture capital investor. It is very happy to take um, a certain number of bets on small companies with very high potential. I'm talking about two, three, four, five, ten times returns. Um, but if you do that across ten or fifteen different companies, then you sort of spread the risk. Um, the return too, of course, but you you spread the risk, uh, and so it, it becomes much lower than you would kind of think just by looking at the portfolio. I I don't take that approach because um, I think that's two things. One, liquidity. A lot of those small companies have very low liquidity, and with the AUM that I have, I I don't think it would work. And two, um, you know. It's pretty hard to get proper information about those companies, the markets they're in. They're very small markets. It's very niche. So essentially, it's hard to get an edge there. You need to know people in those industries or companies, and I think it does. Um, and I personally don't. So I'm much more comfortable relying on on public information and personal experience. I don't have it for those companies, but I have it for other companies. You know, I'm talking about the financial industry, for instance, or energy or industrials where I have a lot of personal experience where I, I think I have an edge in the company that it does, I, I, I don't. And it's better to stay out when, when you think you don't. Yeah, it's very interesting to see the contrast in styles between you two. I hadn't quite appreciated that until watching that conversation. And I understand Arson's become aware that there are people out there kind of trying to copy his choices. And given what you've just said about his edge and the spread of the risk and having a number of, placing a number of bets and if one or two work out, then that's great. He's the worst kind of person to imitate as an investor because you might cherry pick from him the wrong companies, whereas it's his overall approach that is successful and he has all the background information. So, yeah, you don't want to be imitating Marcin. No, that, that's a that's a mistake. Yes, that's a mistake. You, it's gonna it's gonna go wrong for you if you do that. He he knows when to buy, when to sell. He has the information. If you if you start doing it, you you're gonna get it wrong. Obviously, obviously, it's a different volatility profile, but volatility is not necessarily equal to risk, or not entirely. Um, so I think there's much more volatility than actual risk in those type of of investments. You're the first French person we've had on Copy Traders Club. I wanted to ask you, do you know the French YouTube channel TV Finance? I see them on YouTube a lot, and they make various videos about eToro, and they have a couple of guys that they talk to, David Derry and Antoine Fressulier. What can you tell us about that channel? I honestly have no idea. I've never watched it. Oh. Because it looks like a proper French TV show about finance. Uh, it's got the theme music and the camera zooms in and there's a woman behind a desk and she's got professional backdrop. And the next thing she's interviewing these guys. Have you heard of either of those guys I mentioned? No, not, not even, no. But the YouTube channel, the, the videos have very few views. So I'm not sure if it's maybe just a small YouTube channel that looks like a TV finance station yeah I, I have no idea i think you know financial content in french is is a it really is a niche no i mean finance is in english the french people in finance work kind of all, all over the world and they work in english so i'm you know I've, I've thought long about doing content in french for instance or or live videos in french i'm not sure it has a lot of value at the end of the day everyone speaks english 
It might be worth when you're running your own YouTube channel to throw out a couple of videos in French for be, yeah. Les Copiers, Nous Autres de la France. Yeah, it, it could be. I think I have probably about a thousand copiers uh, who are French or, or French speakers. It, it could be interesting. I, I would need to try it out. I have no idea, if I'm honest. Well, check it out on YouTube, TV Finance. See what you think. Yeah, I'll let you know. Dear listener, just a little pause here to say a few things directly to you. The calendar is full until the end of the year. That will mean 52 episodes, which seems like a good time to pause and call it season one and take stock. It's been a lot of fun and a lot of time and effort, but I'm pleased to be creating something of value for eToro users, particularly copy traders. Whether there will be a season two depends on a number of factors. I say it elsewhere, but I want to repeat it again here to really encourage a little action from you. If you want to see the podcast continue, you can help by bringing more listeners in. A lot of people still don't know about Copy Traders Club, so post about it on your PI's feed in eToro. Mention it on a Facebook group or in whatever Discord groups you're in. That's not too much of an ask, is it? On the podcast apps, there's always a share function that includes copy link. Use that. Or copy the YouTube channel link and share that. Or share a link to your favorite episode. There are many ways to eat an orange. I also have one of those affiliate links for new eToro signups in every episode's show notes. So, if you know someone interested in signing up, please copy and send them that link and help support the show that way. Now, I know these calls to action that you hear on podcasts can easily be ignored, and I always ignore them myself, let's be honest. But this time, I am asking you, as someone who listens to and enjoys this one-person independent podcast, to make a little effort to help it along. You can even press pause and take two minutes to do it right now. If you do, know that I am grateful. If you don't, every time you hear this bit, you will be overcome with a crippling sense of guilt and unworthiness. Until you do. Back to the show. Okay, let's get into your portfolio and your investing approach a little bit more. First of all, you have a very detailed pinned post in which you say the following. My objective is to consistently outperform the S&P 500. My investments follow two strategies, growth, stocks with fantastic opportunities, and value, undervalued stocks. I'm generally active and prone to swing trading. I always seek to maintain a medium risk. I almost exclusively trade US and European stocks. I avoid leverage and shorting, except exceptionally for hedging purposes. Okay, you've covered quite a few of those things already in the chat today. In your interview with Marcin, you said you might go as high as 10% in Chinese stocks. I see currently you've got a little bit of Baba and a little bit of Baidu. Where are you with your move into more Chinese? Halfway through, I would say. Um, I don't think I would go the full 10% for Chinese stocks. Um, full 10% would be maybe emerging markets in general, including Korea or Taiwan, which are not really emerging economies, but maybe emerging financial markets. I think the more I think about it and the more convinced I get. I think there's a great value opportunity in China at the moment. Sentiment is at an all-time low, or pretty much valuations are at an all-time low. Um, but if you 
if you read the news there and try to inform yourself, there are, I think, positive signs that um, the Chinese Communist Party is pretty happy with what they've done already and they're keen to appease tensions a little bit. They probably won't go much further. And a lot of what they're doing is really geared towards the sort of common good of the population. I mean, it sounds like a, a communist slogan, but it's actually true, you know, trying to avoid monopolies, trying to redistribute wealth a bit more equally. Um, there are things that I think are good for society, but also for the economy as a whole. That means that the Chinese middle and lower classes might get a little bit wealthier and so might consume a little more. And these are good for, you know, e-commerce companies such as Alibaba, for instance. So I think, you know, there is risk, but it's not all bad. And I think long term, they have a good economy, which is going to get more balanced with the higher quality growth. And that's what I want to invest behind. And the way I want to deal with risk is by targeting the sort of very large cap, very systemic companies in China, the ones that have the support of the government. Um, that is not necessarily Alibaba, but a company like Baidu, for instance, is a, a pioneer in artificial intelligence, which is a, a key topic for, for China. So that's the sort of angle I think that, that I want to, to adopt when I, when I look at China investments, you know, things that are not too controversial, things that have the support of the government and that can ride the sort of wave of the growing middle and, and lower class in, in China. Because of the risk, I think, you know, somewhere between five and, and 10% is okay. I'm not keen to do more. Complement it with a little bit of emerging markets. I think Brazil, Mexico are, are interesting economies, um, Korea as well. So I want exposure to that. Um, it provides good returns and also good diversification against the, the US. Um, and, and I think I have a good angle. So, you know, keen to create a, a little more, but not too much more. It's really interesting what you say about China. It's a topic I brought up on a conversation recently, and it didn't really go anywhere, where I was trying to say, is it really so bad what the Chinese government are doing? Is this not a responsible way of controlling capitalistic growth hmm. so that it doesn't become the kind of rampant capitalism that's a destructive force? You know, people are jumping up and down, oh, this is communism. And I was trying to ask someone, can you not see the the good in it? Regulation isn't necessarily a bad word. I agree, Gavin. I mean, I think we need to avoid looking at the world through an American neoliberal lens, or you're going to get it wrong. China is communist in name, not really in practice. It's an authoritarian state, that's, that's for sure. Um, but communists, no. <laughs> And so using that word already sort of misdirects people. I mean, I agree. A lot of what they're doing is, is for the common good. Um, of course, they're looking at consolidate their power, the Communist Party. That, that's for sure. Um, there's no way around it. But they know that they can't do that if the population is, is poor and, and discontent. So I think they're doing it in a, in a pretty smart way. And yes, regulation sometimes has been or often has been a bit. What they've done has been a little bit brutish, you know, um, no explaining, targeting companies seemingly at random or industries seemingly, seemingly at random. I think there's an overall strategy and objective behind. The execution has been a bit poor, inconsistent, but they're getting better at it. And I think I can sort of see where they want to go. And I think they're getting there with a lot of bumps along the way. But I think, you know, it's only going to get better from here. I made a reference earlier to you and Marcin discussing portfolio composition. Can you describe your approach to that? What are your guiding principles when managing a portfolio? So the, the over, overarching theme, I think, behind my investments is, is what you call GAP, growth at a reasonable price. And that's the, the core of the portfolio, trying to find companies that are growing, are successful, have provide good returns, but are reasonably priced. I, I have a portfolio of conviction, several convictions, I would say, several themes um, that, according to my analysis, are, are looking great. But I don't put all of my eggs in the, in the same basket. So, you know, I try to strike a balance between conviction and diversification and risk management. Um, 
So that means investing behind, you know, I think it's five, six, seven overarching themes in, in the portfolio that you can see or sectors or, or industries with, I would say, no more than 15% behind a single, a single idea or theme. What are those themes quickly? One would be home building in the United States. Um, another one would be the growth of the semiconductor industry, for instance. There's another one which would be about digitization of, of the economy. You know, there are, there are several others. You know, there's been automotive, for instance, um, that has been quite prominent in the, in the portfolio for a while. Uh, so that would be, I think, the, the key things. Obviously, renewable energy um, is another one. Infrastructure is, is another one. I think we're at a point where our infrastructure is old, cranking, and um, needs, to be, needs to be renewed. So I think those are some of the main themes that I invest behind. And, and when I have a theme, I sort of look at the whole value chain around that industry or that particular theme and look sort of where the value is going, you know. Um, is it distribution? Is it manufacturing? Is it uh, B2C, B2B? You know, trying to, to figure out what the value chain is and uh, where to best put the, the capital to work. In terms of assets, we have stocks, almost 94%, ETFs, 3.3%, and crypto, a little under 3%. So you're very much stocks-focused. Absolutely. And the ETF that I have is a, is a stock ETF. So you could say I'm, I'm 97% stock. Um, I mean, that's what I've been doing all of my life, you know, analyzing companies and uh, their market cap, investing into companies, buying companies. So that's, that's just what I do best. Um, and I think you need to be aware of your, of your skills um, and of the skills that you don't have when you invest. On your pin post, there's a link to latest portfolio update, which has your portfolio composition and a couple of pie charts, which explains the sector breakdown, strategy breakdown, size breakdown, and geographic breakdown. Well, this is a great uh, summary you've got. I hope so. I mean, I want to provide people with a, an, easy, uh, an easy way to understand how the portfolio is built, you know, the, the sectors and themes and geographies that, that I invest behind. So hopefully those four pie charts give a, a good overview of, of what I'm doing. And your pin post also links to your review by Felix Falix. It does indeed. I, I like his reviews. I think um, he has a, a knack for spotting what matters. Yeah, it was very complimentary of you, wasn't it? It was, it was fairly complimentary, although it did point with reason the fact that i had little experience on on the platform um so maybe in a few months we do a sort of follow up video or something i don't know um could be interesting um but yeah yeah it was um it was given that we mentioned earlier about you coming from this background and being rooted in portfolio management i wonder what sort of behaviors do you see on etoro that make you think that someone is not a good portfolio manager? What can we copiers look out for as red flags? If you look at a portfolio and you see that all of the companies are, for instance, very high risk, high volatility, then you can see that the, the person is probably a bit of a gambler. And that's I think that's the first red, red flag for me, you know, looking at the sort of volatility and risk of the companies in portfolio. Um, the second thing I look at is, okay, do all of those companies move in, in tandem? Um, i.e., are we investing behind the same industry or the same trend? And so if I see a portfolio which is entirely tech, for instance, and very similar tech, then I think that's another, that's another red flag. Um, because, you know, the day things go down, then, then the whole, the whole thing is going to go down. The whole portfolio is going to go down. Um, and there's no bottom. So I think that's the, that's the two main things. Um, potentially also over exposure to one single geography. You know, I see a lot of portfolios that are China only. I think that's not really acceptable given the level of risk that we have at the moment. There are other portfolios which are crypto only, which is more acceptable, I would say, but still, um, be aware of the risk. That's more acceptable because the PI is obviously a crypto specialist. 
or presenting themselves as such? Exactly. If you are or claim to be a crypto specialist and have a, a sort of all crypto portfolio, you know, you think you have an edge there, then then it's okay. But you need to be upfront about it. I think you need to be upfront about the the risk that's involved and the, the volatility that copiers are going to get. And then it's okay. I think um, the, the third red flag that I sometimes see is a sort of disconnect between what people say about themselves or their portfolio and what you actually find in the portfolio. And, and you see that a lot. Um, you know, I'm a value investor, and then all of your stocks have PEs over 100 times. Then probably you're not a value investor, you know. Or I control risk in such and such way, and then you look at the portfolio, and it's not really the case. Position sizing, you know, someone has 20% of a portfolio in, in one single stock. <laughs> you know, um, complicated. So, yeah, those are, I think, the three things that I, that I, that I look at, you know, overexposure to one sector, one geography. Um, inconsistency between what you say and what you do some of the, the key red flags that you get okay speaking of red flags tell us about your worst ever investment and what did you learn from it i think my worst ever was one of the very first on the platform i bought into aston martin shortly after the new shareholders came in uh, so that was before the the stock was um, split or reverse split. So I bought it at 50 something uh, pence and it went down about 30, 30% in a matter of weeks. And then there was the first quarterly call um, behind the new, with, with the new owner in place. And it was terrible. It was terrible. The management team was terrible. They did a, a terrible job during that quarterly call. There was no vision for the company, no plan, no project, no attractive forecast. And it, it just seemed that they, they didn't have the situation under control at all. And at that time, Aston Martin was threatened by bankruptcy, right? So I sort of listened to that call and it's like, there is no way this management team is going to turn around the company. So I got out and I took a loss of about 40% on my investment and I got out. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately for the company, um, the, the new chairman made the same call as I did, i.e. that management team is not going anywhere. And so a few, a few weeks later, it was announced that the management team was changing. And the new management team has done, has done really well, and the stock has done, has done really well. So if I had not sold that investment, I would probably have a, a very decent profit. In inside selling was a mistake, I think. With the information that I had at the time, st still kind of think that it was the right call, but obviously, time proved me wrong there. Um, so that, I think that was my my worst mistake right at the beginning. Well, and it was a difficult one to swallow because it went down and then back up again. Exactly, and I sold at the low. Yeah. Well, you say that was early on in your time on eToro, but your early month stats are all healthy, so it obviously didn't hurt too much. I suppose you would point to your diversified portfolio and risk management. Of course, yes. I had about 20 stocks at that time, and this one was one of the lowest weights in the in the portfolio. I mean, when you invest in a company that is close to bankruptcy, you're obviously aware of the risk and you size that position accordingly. So thankfully, the other 19 investments did, did pretty well. Well, which one has done the best in your history on eToro or outside of eToro? I think Ally is the one that I like most. It might not be the the highest return, but I think when you look at the return and the volatility that the stock had during the last 12 months, it's been great. I think I've close to tripled my money on this investment in around 10, 12 months with virtually no volatility. The stock hasn't had a drawdown of more than 7% maybe during, during that period of time. That's a great investment. And it's a, you know, a very simple thesis but you sort of see it before everyone else does. And so you get in and the things go exactly according to plan. No volatility, just all the sort of events and the quality reports confirm your original thesis and you triple your money. You haven't had any volatility. And it's just, that's just beautiful when it happens. Why can't it always be like that? Yes, unfortunately it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Your largest position 
with an invested amount of 5.5% is Micron, uh, which is currently minus 12.3%. Tell us a bit about Micron and why is there a lot of uh, negative sentiment around it at the moment? Sure. Uh, so to be to be fair, I first got into Micron when it was trading at around 50, 55. So the loss is, is because I rethink the portfolio a few months back. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm up a good amount on that investment, but indeed it's been doing quite poorly this year. It's been doing poorly because we're talking about chip making. The memory industry there has been historically very cyclical with periods of booms and, and busts. Essentially, whenever prices go up, manufacturers supply more memory to the industry and the sort of balance switches back in favor of purchasers. And so prices collapse, margins collapse, and companies become unprofitable. The whole chip industry has been historically cyclical and the, the memory in particular. Um, and that's why you see my, Micron trading at seven times next year's EBITDA, which is, which is very, very low for a company growing at that pace. And so that's the sort of bear case that is dominating the headlines at the moment, i.e. this is very cyclical and the cycle is turning or about to turn. Prices are about to decrease and margins are, are about to, to um, go down significantly. And I have a very, very different view on that one. Uh, and my view is the whole chip industry, I think, is undergoing a completely secular change, um, going very fast through the use of new technologies. We're talking about electric vehicles, artificial intelligence, huge data centers, and essentially all equipment becoming electronic. And you have chips everywhere. You have chips in your fridge. You have chips in whatever household appliance that you're, that you're buying. Um, so I think there's a sort of like radical step change in the in the chip industry that's happening and that people are missing. And you know, look at the share prices of Nvidia, um, AMD over the last the last five years. You know, it's been exponential. And I think they're still undervalued. People still don't realize the sort of magnitude of the change that's happening. And in memory specifically, this is compound, compounded by specific segment factors. Um, and one is the consolidation. I mean, there used to be 10 manufacturers of memory chips in the past, and now you're down to three, three or four, which makes it look a lot like a, an oligopoly. And, you know, those three, four manufacturers are looking at each other, and no one has an incentive to start producing more, you know, spend more capex to increase capacity. Because if they do it the way they're doing now, which is, you know, grow production very sensibly, then they can keep prices very high and be very profitable. And so I think people haven't realized what it means, the fact that this industry consolidated so much. Um, they also don't realize that all products are increasingly memory hungry. Um, your laptops has twice or three times as much memory as before. So does your phone. So does your fridge. So does your car. Same with data centers. Artificial intelligence is a huge um, driver also of, of memory forward. So. You have that sort of whole secular trend across the whole semiconductor industry. And on top of it, you have very specific events impacting the, the memory, which is consolidation, which is which means that essentially it will remain cyclical, but the cycles will be, I would say, much less cyclical than before. Um, it will go much, much less low and much less high than 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 in the past. So, you know, my thesis is that a business like this would be valued at around 15 times. I mean, it's growing at 20, 30 percent per year, right? Demand for memory is growing at 20, 30 percent per year. And that's going to be the case for the next five years, at least. Yeah, this is the case I heard uh, Monish Babrai talking about in the sort of earlier part of last year, pretty much just mm -hmm. after the lows, yeah. March and April. He was talking about the the change in cyclicality and the oligopoly. I was waiting for the word oligopoly in your answer. I was delighted to hear it. <laughs> so you're still bullish on Micron long term? Yes, absolutely. I think um, this is a company that is going to, to grow at 20, 25% top line and bottom line, possibly more for the next five years. And on top of that, the valuation multiple should, should re-rate significantly when people realize that the cyclic, cyclicality of the past is, is no longer there, this is going to trade above 10 times forward EBITDA for sure. Yeah, that's your opinion, not financial advice, obviously, as I say at the end of every show. 
Let's talk a little bit about your copiers, Hugo. Who should copy you and who shouldn't copy you? Anyone that shares my investment objective should copy me. I think it's a very simple answer. Are you happy to leave it at that? Yeah. Is there a right way or a wrong way to copy you? The right way is to start copying me. And if you have cash available, um, add the cash whenever I call the dip. <laughs> I've, I've done that in the past and people have been happy about it. I mean, back in sort of mid-May, I told people, look, I think this is a, a long-term bottom and this is a great time to, to add money to, to the copy. And I think that call was quite correct when it comes to small cap and people have been happy about it. So leave, leave your, leave your capital into the copy. And if you can add money when I, when I call for a bottom, the wrong way obviously is to jump in and out of the copy. And I've, I've had people doing that, um, jumping in and out every couple of days or week. And, you know, those people always jump out at the bottom and buy back at the top. You know, I've been, apart from the last two months, I've been generating positive returns very cons consistently over the last 12, 15 months. I mean, I've had pretty much no green month. And despite that, about 25 to 30% of my copiers managed to lose money on the copy. So think about it. Do you recommend a certain stop loss or anything? I, I think I do. And I'm a bit, I'm a bit sad on this, you know, because I think I, I manage risk very well. And so there's no reason to have a stop loss on my, on my copy because I'm, I'm always in control of what's going on. Um, but then if I take a step back and think more as a sort of wealth manager or financial advisor rather than a pure investor, I couldn't recommend to a, a wealth management customer to not have a stop loss because there's always the risk that an investor is going to blow up, is going to do something rash, is going to lose their minds or, or whatever. So for that, for that reason, when people ask me, you know, should I have a stop loss on my, on my copy? I say yes. But don't set it too tight. Exactly. I tell people to allow for at least 25% drawdown on, on their copy. I mean, I'm a stock investor, so those drawdowns do happen. 25, 30% feels about right to me. What role should you as a PI play in a copier portfolio? And describe that ideal portfolio with you in it. Obviously, the ideal portfolio depends on each investor's or each copy trader's appetite towards risk. But, you know, for my own appetite, for instance, if I, if I, if I were a copier, I would, I would copy a sort of a low volatility bond focused trader with around a third of my capital. And there are some good examples, some good, some good PIs who do that on, on eToro, low volatility, low risk portfolio. And these are great because it's essentially a much better substitute than, than cash. You know, it offers a lot of liquidity. You can withdraw your cash at any moment if you need it for your, your personal expenses, but obviously it generates a much better return than, than cash. So I would, I would put probably 30% of my capital in there and the remaining 70, I would spread across probably two to three equity investors and a crypto investor. That's an interesting answer. And so I would say within the equity investors, I would be the medium risk. I think I would go for a lower risk US and Europe focused equity investor. I would go for a higher risk sort of archetype investor. I mean, here I want to say Jay, um, but obviously can't be copied anymore. And I'd go with someone who is more medium risk diversified like, like I am. What changes would you like to see on eToro? On the investing side, I would like it a lot if copiers were able to copy the, the actual percentages rather than the percentage invested um, in terms of my, my portfolio. That would make my life much easier. Not so much need to synchronize everything all the time. And it would also make it tied to the way the risk is calculated on, on eToro. Um, I would also like to see more st statistics about investors 
about risk, volatility, sharp ratio. I mean, there's there's a lot of things you can do to be able to to sort of better assess what people are doing. You know, maybe charts with sector diversification so that uh, I don't need to produce them and you can compare everyone like for like. That would make it the sort of copier experience much easier, I think, and that would provide more and better information to them. And two, I would say the social side of things could be improved. The sort of eToro, I call it the wall, uh, the news feed is a bit of a mess. There is no way to separate good content from bad content. It's full of spam, which means that for PIs and other people, it's really difficult to generate engagement organically on, on eToro because your good posts get sort of covered by a lot of noise. That's a bit, that's a bit of a shame. So I think, you know, you could look into what Facebook are doing, what Twitter are doing to make the social aspect of things a little bit easier for, for everyone, you know, create lists of people you follow and of people whose content you want to see. Um, there's, there's a lot of things you, you can do to, to make the sort of community aspect of it much, much better and much more rewarding. We've mentioned a couple of them, but what other PIs would you say you know best on a personal level? Robert and, and Marcin would be the oh, two. the two of them? Yeah, yeah, the two of them. I also met with Gasper, who was a host on your show a while ago. He was uh, in Barcelona a couple of weeks ago and we had the opportunity to have a chat. Very interesting guy, very interesting guy. I, I really enjoyed the, the conversation that, that we had. So those are the, the three PIs that I spoke directly with, but Marcin and, and Robert are the two, that, the two that I know best. All Copy Traders Club alumni? Indeed. I'm, I'm the last one to, to come to the show. Uh, but you, you know, I, I know you keep the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Final question, Ugo. If you were in my shoes, what question would you like to have asked yourself that I didn't? I think you've done a great job. There isn't anything obvious. I would say some, something you could try to have a little bit of fun is to ask your PIs to pitch themselves. I explain why they think that they're, they're the best investor or why they think that they're a great investor. I, where is their edge? What kind of, you know, advantage that they have versus other people? Why do they think that they can beat the market? Um, and I think that would be a good way to get right to the substance of, of someone because, you know, the people who know what they're doing and know their strengths are usually the ones that are going to outperform while the ones that can't really explain what they're doing or don't really know their strengths are probably the ones that are most likely to, to underperform. Okay, so pitch yourself then. Pitch myself. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I, I hate those, by the way. I'm saying it exactly, exactly for that reason. Um, I, I, I hate those elevator pitches. So why, why should you copy me? I, I am an, an investor with 10 years of professional experience, um, very diverse across investment banking, private equity, and within companies. That has sort of given me a, a 360 view of, of the economy and how things work in, in real life. From that experience and, and my education, I think that I am sort of able to see things in a way that, that most people don't. Very few people globally have, have that experience. Very few people have a, a, a brain wired the way that mine is. And I think very few people know themselves as well as, well as I do. And so for those reasons, I think that I'm, I'm set to outperform for the, for the long term. Um, discipline, passion, experience, I think are the three, the three key factors that are going to ensure long term success. And, um, if anything, the last 15 months of experience on Itoro proved just that. Great job. We're at the 32nd floor. I have to get out. <laughs> Yeah, that was obviously improvised. If I had prepared it, I would have done a much a much better job at it. Well, it was your question. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. I, I think you've given a great, uh, you've built a great picture of what you're all about for the listener. 
your success so far has been magnificent on eToro, and I look forward to seeing how that continues and how you develop now that you're a full-timer and you're going to be communicating more and all the rest of that. Uh, we will watch your progress with great interest. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to be a much more active part of the eToro community and hopefully have a, a positive impact on, on the lives and, and finances of all of my followers and, and copiers. Well, fantastic. You've made a very positive impact here today. Cheers, Hugo. Thank you very much. Goodbye. A very enjoyable chat with a PI who seems like a very solid, stable type of investor. Not short of self-belief, it will be interesting to keep an eye on him now that he is full-time on eToro. That's all from me. You can continue the conversation on Discord and Facebook. If you like this podcast and want to see it continue, you can do your part by recommending it to one person or group of people this week. Until next time we meet at Copy Traders Club, I wish you many happy returns. Obviously, anything in this podcast is for entertainment only, not financial advice. Do your own research, it's just generic chit chat. We don't know your individual circumstances, etc., etc., and so forth.